Joining now is Senator Bob Menendez, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and the highest ranking Latino and Cuban American in Congress. Senator, thank you so much. We have so many questions for you. We've never seen protests this large. Uh, from my memory, correct me if I'm wrong, it's even bigger than 1994. But the government was able to shut them down after Sunday by cutting the Internet, cutting phones, by, you know, arresting people. So what is the import of these historic protests? Is this or is this not a tipping point, potentially? Andrea, your memory is good. Uh, this is uh, one of the largest, most significant protests because it spans the whole of the country, not just Havana, which of course is urban uh, and where the San Isidro movement has been militating now for a while, but across the entire country, including in the countryside. Uh, and it just expresses the depth of discontentment that the Cuban people have uh, with the regime. Uh, on their economic suffering, on the COVID handling, on the lack of liberties and basic freedoms. Uh, and so uh, we don't know. From my information from inside of the island is that protests have continued. The problem is, is that the regime has shut down the internet for two reasons. Number one, so that the Cuban people can communicate with each other and can't know what's happening in the island as they peacefully protest. And number two, so that the rest of the world doesn't know what's happening inside. Uh, and you only shut the internet if you fear your citizens in, in the first place. So uh, I think this is an extraordinary moment, one that I hope the United States responds to uh, by a series of actions that I think can be very helpful to the Cuban people. I want to get there because the policy questions now are a lot in your lap as well as, of course, the White House. But the Cuban economy has been crushed by the pandemic. Tourism is shut down. No approved COVID vaccines, blackouts, food shortages, uh, exacerbating what had existed previously under the Trump sanctions and the other sanctions. Cuba's president is blaming the protests on U.S. sanctions. President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken have come out very strongly in support of the protesters, criticizing the regime in strong language. Are there steps now that the White House should take around the margins of the November post-election Trump sanctions to allow Cuban Americans to start wiring remittances back home, perhaps even resume American tourism once it is COVID safe? Well, first of all, I applaud President Biden and uh, Secretary Blinken for the strong statements and solidarity with the Cuban people and in a strong message to the Cuban regime not to use violence uh, against their citizens who are peacefully protesting. And we have seen violence uh, by the Cuban regime, which is a historical repression that they do every time the Cuban people uh, rise to seek protests. In terms of changes, look, you know, I, I want to be able to send uh, my aunt in Cuba money, but the regime takes 20 percent off the top of every dollar I send. Then they take the balance of that dollar and convert it into pesos, which is worth a fraction of what I'm sending. No country in the world does that. The regime has to change in order to let the Cuban people thrive. The regime has dollar stores where there is an overwhelming amount of food and supplies. Uh, but of course, uh, those are held exclusively for those who can get access to dollars and the regime gouges them. The regime still sanctions, I mean, or I should say, keeps people uh, on, uh, you know, long lines to get basic foods as a way of controlling the people. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, I wrote Title II of the Libertad Act, commonly known as the Helms-Burton Act. It speaks about all the things the United States would do in aid and trade and assistance to the Cuban people if there is an opening in Cuba. And so it's in the regime's hands. The embargo that exists is by the regime against its own people. But we're helping countries all over the world with vaccines without regard to politics through COVAX, but Cuba doesn't, isn't part of COVAX. They've received nothing and they've got three uh, locally produced vaccines that have not yet been authorized for emergency use. They have no vaccines, basically. Well, uh, first of all, they say that their vaccines are effective. I don't know whether they are or they aren't. And I certainly could be an advocate of offering vaccines uh, by the United States to the Cuban people, but not through the regime. They will even use vaccinations as a way to reward their supporters and to punish uh, their opponents. Can't permit that. Now, whether we can use an international health organization that the Cubans let in, whether we can use the Catholic Church, which is trusted, those are possibilities. But once again, the fundamental question is a regime 
that oppresses its people in ways we as Americans can't fully understand, in its state security apparatus, in its control of the economy, in its inability to allow people to have basic freedoms. And if we can get the type of openings that all of us as citizens enjoy in the United States and most of the free world, then in fact the Cuban people will prosper. They're an, an in ingenious industrial group, but at the end of the day they're stifled by their own government. There's tons of opportunities, you know, when, the, when at the height of tourism the Cuban government still rationed the Cuban people. When, when the Obama uh, administration opened up totally to Cuba, the Cuban government still rationed the Cuban people. They still arrested journalists and uh, political prisoners and independent analysts. So at the end of the day, no matter if we continue just to believe that we can change the course of events in Cuba by opening up and, you know, jeans and Coca-Cola, that's not going to change the realities of the Cuban people. We've got to challenge the regime. And, I, and the last point I'd make, I hope we can internationalize that effort. This shouldn't be a U.S.-Cuba issue. The, the international community should be listening to the cries of the Cuban people for basic freedoms as recognized by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Are there specific actions you want the White House to take right now? Well, I think they're continuing messaging and support to the Cuban people. I think we should be messaging to the Cuban military, whose, uh, whose uh, motto is we draw our strength from the people. Well, the people are protesting. Don't turn your arms against your brothers and sisters as they peacefully protest. There's a place for you in a democratic Cuba as long as you don't have blood in your hands. I think we should be looking at how we can expand access to the Internet, considering satellite feed of internet so that people on the island can communicate with each other. Uh, and I think uh, that, that we should be looking at, at how we internationalize this effort, uh, whether it's at the OAS or through other countries in the world that should be also speaking out about human rights and democracy in Cuba as they do in so many other places in the world. Senator Bob Menendez, I know you've got a heavy schedule and you've got to go, but thank you very much for taking time for us today, sir.